You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, the green gold rush, how lithium is crucial in the UK's transition to renewable energy. We explain how satellites are being used in the fight against climate change. And the man on a mission to make insects the food of the future. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. And one of those solutions is electrification. But to effectively reduce our fossil fuel emissions, we need to do it on a vast scale. And to use renewable energy rather than coal and gas-fired power stations, electricity will need to be stored at scale in batteries. So lithium, the crucial ingredient for batteries, is vital to the green energy transition. So where is lithium found and mined? Well, Australia is currently at the top of the list, then Chile, which is believed to have the world's largest reserves, and then China. Before it's ready to be taken to the electric car, that lithium needs to be processed. So it's not just enough to have natural deposits. If you want to make batteries, you need the factory capacity too. And China dominates battery manufacturing with 77% of the world's capacity in 2020. Europe, not including the UK, lags far behind. Now, the UK is on neither of these charts because despite having large deposits of lithium, we currently import import everything from countries who do mine it and build the batteries. Lisa Holland reports from Cornwall. Cornwall's barren landscape has long been mined, but never before has there been such urgency for new exploration to bear fruit. Drilling deep underground into hard rock, they've discovered lithium, the key component for batteries for electric vehicles but the UK is desperately playing catch-up. The penny's just recently dropped. We are way, way behind China. China's a centrally planned economy. They've been planning this for years. They can see the electric vehicles on the horizon. They've locked up all the supply chain they need. And really, that puts Europe and the UK at a significant disadvantage. From boreholes, they've also found lithium in geothermal waters. In a porter cabin, Geologists showcase their treasure, but mining and processing the metal on a scale to meet the UK's needs could be a decade away. The test site itself is still under construction. Mining companies are looking at the landscape with fresh eyes. It's not fossil fuels that the world needs, but metals for green technologies. What lies beneath, nobody knows for sure. But with the phasing out of petrol and diesel cars, there are fears the supply of important metals may not match demand. Lisa Holland, Sky News, Cornwall. So how could the UK use specialist materials like lithium to create greener energy? Well, with me now is Karen Hudson-Edwards, Professor in Sustainable Mining at the University of Exeter. Welcome to you. So what part can lithium play in our push to cut down on our carbon emissions? Well, Anna, you've really touched on it already. We really need lithium to make lithium ion batteries. And these are rechargeable batteries that can be used in electric cars, in our mobile phones, in our laptops. And with the growing need to reduce our carbon emissions, we really need to be producing a lot more lithium to make these batteries and make this technology. So what are the prospects for mining lithium in this country without a cost to the environment? I think they're very good, actually. So I work down in Cornwall, and we've seen a resurgence in exploration. We have granite rock that underlies the whole of Cornwall. It's lithium bearing. It's very special granite. And several companies are exploring for lithium in the hard rock, but also in the geothermal fluids. And this can be done in, in a way that doesn't harm the local environment? Yes, the prospects are looking very good. So the geothermal lithium, for example, the mining, uh, all you're going to do is take the waters through a borehole, extract the lithium, and then put the water back in the borehole. So there's no waste. And in some of the hard rock deposits in Cornwall, uh, you're going to be taking them from the clays. So you're going to have some waste product, but that waste can be reused for other things. 
And for example, a small company makes bricks that contain holes that bees can hibernate in. Karen Hudson-Edwards, thank you. In today's other climate news, campaigners are warning against a shift to hydrogen to heat our homes unless it's made from clean energy. Environmental groups have jointly written to the government criticising it for investing in hydrogen production. They want ministers to commit to renewable ways of making hydrogen to help the UK move away from fossil fuels. The United States climate envoy will visit the UK in the next few days for talks on enhancing global climate ambition ahead of the COP26 summit in Glasgow. John Kerry's meeting government and business leaders in Italy today. He'll also head to Germany on his five-day trip. A study says the world has to replace wheat, maize and rice with kelp, maggots and algae to create risk-resilient diets in the face of climate change. Researchers at Cambridge University say radical changes to the world's food system will be needed in an era of growing environmental threats. They say farming microorganisms such as spirulina to create so-called future foods could help bring an end to global malnutrition. Now, with less than six months to go until the COP26 climate summit, its president has warned the world is still not on track to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. In a speech building up to the event in Glasgow, Alok Sharma said human activity is imperiling the planet. If we do not take this chance to keep 1.5 degrees alive, it will slip from our grasp. And so will our best hope of building the future we want to see. So COP26 must be the moment that every country and every part of society embraces their responsibility to protect our precious planet. With me now is Tom Rivett Karnak, who was the chief political strategist for the Paris Agreement and co-founder of Global Optimism. So hello to you. Alok Sharma there stressing the importance of COP26. But there are some doubts that it can go ahead in person because of the pandemic. How important is that in-person element, do you think? Could the Paris Agreement have been struck if the conference then had been virtual or even semi-virtual? Well, it's a very good question. And, and first of all, thank you for having me. Love the show. Um, so I mean, Alok Sharma clearly there setting out a statement of intent that he's going to do everything possible to ensure that COP26 can go ahead in person. And if you listen to what he said, it's clear that he understands the profound importance that people are able to gather in person. And particularly, he called out the fact that it's the vulnerable countries that need to come in particular. I mean, everyone needs to come, but the vulnerable countries coming being represented there in person provides them with a platform to be on the world stage, to advocate for these policies that are going to be so fundamental for their survival. Now, when everybody gets together in the format of a COP, that jeopardy and that tension of an in-person meeting, the personal relationships, the late nights, the working together, there is something about the crucible of that time spent together and the forging of those relationships towards that common outcome that I think sometimes can precipitate these breakthroughs. Well, yes, and that moment when the Paris Agreement was struck was a moment of pure joy in the hall amongst all those gathered there. What would prompt that level of joy in Glasgow? What does success look like for COP26? There was a moment of real tension when the gavel had to come down and we needed unanimous agreement that we were all going to adopt the Paris Agreement together. And that's what sparked that outpouring of joy. It was that real jeopardy, that last minute negotiation. Now, this year in Glasgow, it's a bit different. What success would look like is each individual country coming back to the table under the Paris Agreement and making an increased nationally determined commitment towards ensuring that we can keep 1.5 degrees on track. So it will be a bit different. It's, it's unlikely that we will have that moment of kind of global togetherness of gaveling, but it's very important that we try to construct that moment. So success really looks like getting our emissions trajectory back on track with 1.5 degrees. Thank you. Scientists say Earth observation satellites are playing a vital role in detecting climate change. The data generated from the images is being used to monitor the pace of global warming and its impact across land and sea. So what can it tell us? These are the eyes on the planet and we're going to have the most detailed and comprehensive uh, view of how the surface of the Earth, the atmosphere, the oceans, everything, all components of the Earth system um, are responding to climate change. Different frequencies that the satellite measures have been combined to highlight certain characteristics of the surface. So the reds here 
actually represent vegetation cover. The vegetation we're looking at is actually planted crops. It's not the tropical forests that once existed across this uh, part of Bolivia. That crack is, is going to um, reach a, a second crack called Halloween crack and a huge iceberg is going to fall. And you could put London and New York or, or let's say London and Delhi on that iceberg and you'd still have room to spare. And when you're talking about sea level rise, it's not the global mean that actually matters. It's what's happening at the coast next to London or, or Los Angeles or San Francisco or Rio de Janeiro. These are incredibly detailed, um, sophisticated measurements, far more than, you know, if you like, a high resolution picture. Now, earlier, we heard how scientists think that eating insects could be key to saving the planet. Well, they're already eaten by around 2 billion people across the world, but many Western countries struggle with the concept. In today's Climate Diaries, we hear from Francesco Magno, who's on a mission to make crickets the food of the future. Bugs. Yes, bugs. Compared to other animal-based protein, insects need just a fraction of land, water, of feed, and they just emit a very few greenhouse gases to produce the same amount of protein. That's why they are very sustainable. And they are eaten as a traditional food all around the world. The problem is just in the West, where we are, because we don't consider them as a traditional food and we are stopped by the yak factor. We started Small Giants because we wanted to do our bit to change the world. We gave to thousands of people the possibility to change their perception towards edible insects and they are now considering them as another kind of healthy food. And that's it for today's show, but you can get your climate fix over the weekend with our podcast. On this week's episode, we're talking to climate activist Luisa Neubauer about how she took the German government to court and won. That's on Climatecast and it's available wherever you normally get your podcasts from. And on our weekly digital show this week, we go behind the scenes at the world's biggest wind turbine in Blythe. That's available on Sky News social channels, our app and our website. Thanks for watching and see you next week.